And now I will turn things over to Father Jerry. Thanks, Jess. During COVID, uh, we concocted a program that allowed us to introduce um, the Jesuits who had played a role in the life of so many of you during your Fairfield years. Father Jim Bowler, who else, Jess? Uh, we had Charlie Allen, who else did we interview? Father uh, Samiski, Father, Father Rourke, Samiski. we had quite a Father few of Rourke. them. So we had quite a number of Jesuits over the course of that pandemic. And the point was not uh, you know, to push these individual Jesuits, but that, to present them as, as uh, exemplars, if you like, embodiments uh, of, a, of a way of approaching life, of a way of, pro of approaching yourself and God, uh, of a way of entering into this Ignatian spirituality, Jesuit spirituality, that we hope somehow infiltrated your lives, whether you knew it or not, during your years at Fairfield. It was Carolyn Ruzikas who said, okay, wonderful and you know appropriate that we looked at those important Jesuits, but now it's time to look at our alumni and alumni who in their own way, uh, as religious or as married or as single women and men uh, yeah. also have carried out into the world and into their own relationships and their building of families, uh, a vision and a spirituality that was inspired by their time at Fairfield and that has grown based on that initial inspiration. And so uh, with Carolyn's help, Jessica and Janet Canepa and I tried to assemble a, a list of uh, alumni and alumnae that we wanted to uh, highlight. And we're calling this, Jess, what's the name of our series? Alumni Stories, Lives That Inspire. Alumni Stories, Lives That, it's, that Inspire. And the more, I mean, we have a vast list, to be honest with you, of alumni. And these are the ones who are in some obvious way uh, have a story to tell that is deeply inspirational. But I'd go so far as to say that if we had the time, pretty much everybody on this list, pretty much everybody who's here, if we had the time, if we could tell your stories and as, as ambiguous and as mixed in your view as they might be, I'm sure your stories would be inspiring. Um, maybe with their ups and downs, but still stories that would inspire people to have hope and to live with, with to live with love and to live with respect. We're very, very pleased tonight uh, to present to you one of your uh, one of your fellow alumni, uh, Colleen Gibson, member of the class of 2009. Uh, Colleen will tell us about her story. In a Am I wrong with it's not 2009? Nope, 2009, you're right. Okay, 2009. Now, I want to confess from the very beginning, uh, and I say this with incredible uh, gratitude, uh, Colleen is, as you see, has behind her name SSJ. That means sis this is, uh, the Sisters of, of St. Joseph. Of, and the Sisters of St. Joseph um, were the nuns who taught me when I was a little boy a thousand years ago in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. The Sisters of St. Joseph of Chestnut Hill, the, uh, probably the most valiant and most generous or the most troublesome of them, were sent to the wilds of Pennsylvania, of central Pennsylvania, to the Dutch country out of the elite uh, world of Philadelphia to teach the, uh, the country folks like me living in rural Pennsylvania. And I have to tell you that if I'm a Jesuit today, I don't want to blame the sisters, but there's, they have more to do with it than I can possibly uh, explain. Uh, Colleen can say more about their, the, the Jesuit who helped found the sisters, Father Medai, Father Jean-Pierre, Jean-Pierre Jean was he? Jean-Pierre Medai. But Jean-Pierre Medai uh, had what he called maxims. As a little boy, seven years old, 
I was taught, I, I, I memorized this, live your life with one desire only, to be always what God wants you to be. Imagine some nun who had heard this in the novitiate, oh, and I don't know whether you heard it, oh, yeah. but this, this maxim from Father Madai, who wrote this in the 17th century in Le Puy, France, some nun in central Pennsylvania taught us simple kids, and we learned, and it, and it lives with me still, live your life with one desire only, to be always what God wants you to be. And another one that I still that I still memorize and say to myself every day, never think of tomorrow unless it has some necessary link with today, but entrust it entirely to providence. And one more, if everything, in everything and in everywhere, have only God and God's will and God's glory before your eyes and make no account of anything else. I learned about devotion. I learned about generosity. I learned the essentials of Ignatian spirituality before I ever heard the name Ignatius of Loyola from Colleen's sisters. I could mention their names, but I have to out of reverence, Sister Thomas Regina, Sister Theophilus, Sister Raphael, Sister Mary Magdalene, Sister Vincent Ignatius, Sister Isabel, these women to whom I owe so much. So Colleen, on a purely personal note, out of debt of, a debt of gratitude to you and to your community, I welcome you to this opportunity to share your life and your story and your vocation and the special charism of your community. So Colleen, where are you now and what are you up to? Oh, well, Jerry, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I think we are, we're bonded together. Uh, even that last maxim that you quoted, maxim 16 is my favorite. It's the, one of the first ones that I learned as a sister. Keep always before your eyes, God, God's will, uh, and God's grace, and make no account of anything else. So where am I right now? I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. So right now, I find myself uh, studying theology at Boston College, School of Theology and Ministry. I'm studying for Master's of Theological Studies in Practical Theology, so really interested in where the rubber meets the road, where theory and practice work together. And so that's what I do during my days. I read and I write and I interact with the wonderful community here. I'm living with the Sisters of St. Joseph of Boston right now. Um, so it's this wonderful network of Sisters of St. Joseph. And then if you read my bio before you came on here, if you had no clue who Sister Colleen Gibson was, uh, I do some writing ministry. So I write for uh, the National Catholic Reporter, Forgive Us This Day, which is a daily devotional. Um, I have a podcast, Behind the Habit, uh, or Beyond the Habit, uh, which is all about challenging our assumptions of what it means to be Catholic and live the gospel. Uh, and so that's a, a little bit about me and, and what I do these days. Colleen, how um, this is, we had not sort of uh, planned this, but how did you become somebody who became, in effect, uh, found your vocation as a spokesperson? Uh, you know, to, to do podcasts and to do writing. Um, did you ever, enter, how did that happen? Well, I uh, actually, when I was at Fairfield, um, I have to mention him, you know, uh, dear Dr. Paul Lakeland, I went into his office as a, a junior going into my senior year. And I said to him, I, I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I think I, think I might want to be a journalist. Uh, and he wow. looked right at me and he said, you're not a journalist. He said, I've only known you for five minutes, 10 minutes. He said, you're, you, you have an effervescence. I can't picture you in a uh, newsroom full of smoke and full of editors. And he said, maybe you're a writer. And so uh, wow. from that moment forward, and I, I come from a line, my father was an English major uh, in college. So I was always taught, I was the only, I always say I was the only sixth grader who was looking to find their voice. Uh, in the papers they were writing in sixth grade. So I just love to write. And so that has expanded out from there. Um, and I find the easiest thing to write about is your own story and the story of God alive in the world. And so it brings me so much joy. So these things, people always say, how do you have time for the things that you do to write these columns, to how, like film these uh, podcasts? I always say, you know, it brings me joy. It's a great grace to be able to talk about our life. And I think so few people have met sisters or women religious, um, that it's an opportunity. We have to be out there. Uh, back in the day when you had those sisters in Lebanon, 
you know, you had that exposure one-on-one -on -one, and today right. so few people meet sisters that I think it's important in spreading the, the good news of the gospel uh, that everybody can have contact and know that this, this pathway, this vocation in the church exists uh, and that there's people living it and finding joy in it. So, yeah. Colleen, you must find people who say to you, what the hell are you doing? Why are you wasting your life? I mean, people, like I say, they were, they, you know, at the convent of St. Um, Our Lady of the Assumption in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, we probably had 20 nuns, all, all of your sisters. But I mean, as you say, your peers and people in generations both before you and after you, uh, the story of a young woman who's obviously intelligent uh, and, and self-possessed and gifted, um, this must arouse incredible curiosity, your vocation itself. Oh, yeah. I think people, I mean, I was fascinated by it. I think when I first uh, started thinking about the sisters, I had never met a sister before. And so it was. What? It was you this, had never met, I never met a, a sister. religious went to, sister before? Went to public school in New Jersey my whole life, so K through 12. Um, and actually came to Fairfield because it was a Catholic school. And I knew my faith was important. We had been raised. My parents taught my CCD classes in our parish. We did service. I didn't realize it wasn't normal to be at church multiple times a week until <laughs> I talked to other people and I went, oh, oh, you're not doing, you you aren't going on service trips in the summer and things like that. So um, yeah, it, it's just that, you know, when I told people though, uh, it was, a, it was a curiosity, but it was also, you know, um, I had a Jesuit at Fairfield first when I, I told him I was interested. He said, you know, are you going to quit school to do this? I was a freshman. Um, I said, no, that's crazy. Who does that? Well, if you might have in the 1950s or the 1960s, you might have sure. done a year or two in college and then, you know, entered the convent. And I thought, well, that's if being a sister seems strange to quit school. I was like, everyone in my life, I'll be disowned if I, if I quit school to do this. Um, but, you know, there was something about it that I was drawn to the sense of community, um, to the life we lead and to a deep life of of active prayer. We call ourselves contemplatives in action. And so we're doing that work of, of growing in relationship with Jesus, but also growing in relationship with the people of God. And so I saw that in our sisters uh, and I thought, okay, I think this there's something here that I need to look into. And wow. so even when people said, you know, it was, and it was people you thought, I thought, oh, they'll be on board a hundred percent. They were like, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> this is crazy. You know, have you thought about, you know, doing something else? And you can just, you could do service on the side. And then there were people who I thought they, these people will be opposed to this. You know, they'll think I'm throwing, you know, I'm throwing all this opportunity away. And they were the people who said, you know, you are, you light up when you talk about what you do with this. Wow. And wow. so, yeah. So I think it's, you know, it, it was not for me. I really found a home and found a life and found joy. You know, I, when I got here, it was kind of like, oh, oh, I didn't know I was searching for this, but here it is. Wow. Colin, we'll come back to that in a second. But um, you mentioned you're from New where in New Jersey. So I'm from Hillsborough, New Jersey, which is central New Jersey. Okay. And how did you end up coming to Fairfield? So I ended up coming to Fairfield. So I had gone to public school my whole life. Um, and I knew I wanted to go to a Catholic school. I knew my, I had been involved in my youth group, had been involved in a number of things. And so uh, when I looked at different schools, Fairfield, I went into my guidance counselor in high school and said, I want to go to a Catholic school. And they gave me a list of all the Catholic schools in the country. And we're like, here, figure it out. I was, you know, my graduating class from high school was 900 people. So they didn't have time to do one-on-one -on -one discernment. But when I looked at Fairfield, uh, you know, the honors program was really appealing to me. I knew I, I wanted to study American studies, which is a really mm. an interdisciplinary major, and Fairfield had it. Um, when I came to visit, I visited campus ministry because I knew that was going to be important in some way. And so the more and more people I met at Fairfield, I thought, oh, there's, there's something here. I've got to, you know, I've got to try it out. Um, so it was a combination, and it was Ignatian spirituality, the way, Jerry, you kind of said you didn't realize that those sisters were teaching you Ignatian spirituality. I wouldn't have had the words when I was touring around the campus or hearing about the Ignatian Residential College or all these different things. They were using Ignatian spirituality, and it's so rooted in what Fairfield is. Um, 
it was really appealing. There was something, you know, when I would go back and think about where do I want to go, those questions from the Ignatian Residential College, you know, who are you, who's are you, and who are you called to be? They kept on coming back. I was like, I want to answer those questions. And this seems like wow. a place that is open to letting me explore that. Wow. Wow. And so what happened to you when, when you came here? Uh, well, you mentioned Carolyn Rizikas. I Is actually, she here, Carolyn? Are you here? Are you here, Carolyn? Here. Uh, well, I owe a lot to Carolyn. I mean, as a high school senior, I came to visit uh, Kelly Lefley, who I think is here, uh, who was Kelly Beatty then, gave me a tour around. Um, but when I got to Fairfield, you know, I really do I dove in. At first, there were things I didn't realize about Fairfield that I should have. You know, I didn't realize it was on Long Island Sound. I didn't realize, you know, kind of the stereotype of what uh, somebody who went to Fairfield was. Um, Which was what? What was the stereotype? At that then? time, so I, I would have gotten to Fairfield in 2005. Popped collars were in, polo shirts with the, you know, the collar up, kind of a preppy sensibility. I didn't realize there was a beach. Uh, I didn't realize any of those things. Um, so I think I was kind of an anomaly, but I fell in with a group of friends who are still my friends to this day, or some of my wow. dearest friends. Wow. Uh, and, you know, I joined the rugby team. I love my rugby. Wait, 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 wait. You got mixed up with the rugby thugs? Uh, they are not thugs. I always say rugby, it takes one of every kind, 15 people on the field, and we're all there to support one another. So, Oh, you you're know, so defensive of those rugby guys and women. Well, I could take you down, Jerry. I know how to tackle. I'm sure you, you could, at the knees. <laughs> I'm sure you could. <laughs> All right, so so rugby and, and uh, rugby and campus ministry. Yep, and that's what I got involved in. And then academically, uh, I was doing my American Studies thing as part of the honors program, and I took a religious studies course. It was the first course I took at Fairfield, uh, eight a.m. with Nancy Della Valley, wow. RS ten Introduction to Religion, uh, and I remember uh, Nancy just saying, "You know, you're going to have to work hard to get an A in this class," and but she opened opened my universe to a whole different way of thinking about God and looking at God and feminist perspectives on God. Um, and then I think of, you know, Elizabeth Dry, there were all these classes that I took. So eventually I became an American studies major and a religious studies major together and really looked at, you know, how does American society and how does Catholicism operate in American society, uh, which is kind of still what I do today. Wow. Um, yeah, so the foundations see. even of the of the mm -hmm. professional and academic work and and the and the and the writing that you do and the the, the media work you do uh, yeah it was all was really there, nurtured you know? was really nurtured by the people that you met here mm -hmm. yeah and people saw gifts they called forth gifts in me um and I always say you know people will say oh you were the valedictorian of your class and I say you know yes I, I was smart and I studied hard but at Fairfield, it's unique that the, the valedictorian is you write a speech. And so it was that writing. You know, I told stories in that in that speech. I told stories about time doing service in the Philippines um, and that, you know, we we're not called to eventually go out into real life. Like, you know, when you, you say when you graduate, like, welcome to the real world, like that's not actually what is happening. If you at Fairfield, I learned and encountered the real world. I was wow. doing service wow. in Bridgeport. I was thinking big ideas and asking big questions. Jess, did you mention to people that they can ask questions or ask us to uh, address concerns? Did you tell them that? I did. And everybody feel free. If you do have questions, use the chat and you could submit something and, and we'll get to them as they're, we can fit them in or as they're relevant to the topic we're discussing. Obviously, I'm, I'm guessing that there were many of you here who were contemporaries of Colleen's. And so if you'd like to add something uh, or correct her uh, or amplify what she says, this is your, uh, your golden opportunity. Don't miss it. Um, I mean, it's, it's uh, Colleen, it's, it's, it's very, um, it's a very powerful story that you tell. So it was it here. Oh, all right. Thanks, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, <laughs> Jocelyn Colin has said to everybody, everything Colleen has said is true. Would a sister lie to you? I mean, really? <laughs> not, not any of the sisters that I knew. But you damn well better not have lied to them either. Okay, so, so you decided? Did you did you decide while you were here? Um, did the notion of a religious vocation arise while you were here, uh, or did it come later, Colleen? So I, um, I mean, when I tell my vocation story, I always say I started thinking about being a sister probably when I was in 
late middle school, early high school, you know, this thought popped up now because I didn't know any sisters. It was really, I knew, I always say I knew Maria from The Sound of Music and Whoopi Goldberg from Sister Act. And I thought I'm neither one of those sisters. So, you know, this must not be the life for me, but I saw people living their faith. There were lay people in my parish who were living their faith. I was an altar server. We were doing, I, my brother and I were doing all sorts of work at the church. Our family was very active. And I saw priests who, you know, loved their life. And so I thought there's got to be something for women in this church. There's got to be something like that. But I also thought, you know, as I looked into it, this is crazy. And so when I got to Fairfield, my freshman year, I went on a, I went on a Kairos retreat and I said to a Jesuit uh, there, you know, I said, I'm thinking about religious life. And he said to me, are you thinking, are you going to leave? And I said, no, that's, that's crazy. And you Jesuits are very tricky. And so he paused. And then he said to me, but if it comes back, you know, he said, forget about it. And then he said, but if it comes back, then you need to pay attention to this. And, you know, in my 18 year old mind, that was, it never went away. Then it kept on coming back. Never went away. Never, never went, went away. away. And then when I was a senior, I was going into my senior year, I went to World Youth Day uh, with a whole group from Fairfield and met Jesuit schools from all over the world. And there, uh, Mark Scalise, who was at Fairfield. Sure, he was a campus minister then. Yep. Mm -hmm. He, uh, we were looking over Sydney Harbor one night of while we were there. And he said to me, you know, what are you doing? What are you going to do after you graduate? And at that point, I was, uh, I was going to get an internship at Commonweal Magazine. And I, this writing life that I was going to do, it was all set. I smell I said, Paul Lakeland here. <laughs> yeah. So, so I said, you know, I, I think that's what I'm going to do. And he said, no what are you actually going to do with your life? And I thought, oh, we're having that conversation. We're having a vacation <laughs> conversation. We're not talking about what my job is going to be. And I said, you know, I've always thought about, you know, uh, religious life. I said, but I, I, I think it's crazy. I don't, nobody, I can't see anybody who is my age, who's doing it. I don't know any sisters. And he said to me, you know, you have to take a step. If you take a step and you realize you don't like it, then you can, you can write it off and you can go off and be a writer and do all of that. But if you never try, or if you never take a step, you'll never know. And you'll always ask yourself why. And so after that trip, when I came back to the US, um, I went online and you can fill out surveys. You have this website, vocationmatch.com. It's just like match.com. Vocation.com, yeah. really? Vocationmatch.com. Anybody. I, I should suggest. try it and see whether yeah. they tell me I should be a Jesuit. See if you match the Jesuits. And I matched, I didn't know what I wanted. So I checked every box imaginable. Uh, I matched, I think it was something like, I don't know, 240 congregations in the United States. And you answered questions on that survey, like, you know, what's your image of God? What's your prayer life like? And I got many, many emails back, as you can imagine. Um, and one of those emails is from the Sisters of St. Joseph. And I'm a person who loves words. And so our charism, kind of the mission that we live, um, when it, I saw it in writing from all these different vocation ministers, because there's 14 different congregations of Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States. So I got multiple emails. I would read, you know, we believe in a love of God and neighbor without distinction. We believe in finding God in all things. I would read those words and I'd think, oh, there's something, there's something there. I don't know what it is, but I would email them back and say, you know, um, if you could, you know, get in touch with me in three, four or five months, uh, that would be great. And I thought they'll forget, they'll forget about me and then I'll be free. I took the step Mark told me to take and then I'll get off scot-free and, uh, Long story short, or long, <laughs> a little bit shorter, uh, eventually our vocation director, the sister who's kind of in charge of talking to people who might be interested in Philadelphia, a year later, I was working at Commonweal. I had graduated. She called and she said, you know, would you ever want to just come and visit, you know, just like for a, a, like a weekend visit, maybe an overnight. And I said, you know, at that point I was in the right spot. And I just thought, yeah, yeah, I think I'd like to take a step and try it out. And so that set the ball in motion. So what did you see? So eventually you decided that the Sisters of St. Joseph would be your way of taking this risk, of making this move. Mm -hmm. That meant that you were, in, I guess, in a formation program, in a postulancy, and then eventually novitiate. What did that look like? Yeah, so I ended up, I, was, I worked at Commonweal, and I ended up, I left my job. I thought, I can write anywhere. I can take my pen and go anywhere. I said, I need contact with these, with these sisters. I need an experience. Um, and so I did it like Jesuit Volunteer Corps. We had a volunteer program 
And so I went and did the volunteer program with the sisters. And in where the, was that, Colleen? Where it was did in you do Philadelphia. That? Yeah, it was. Well, I good because yeah, that's else. that's that's kind of the cultural the cultural nexus of the the cultural cradle of your community. So what was that like? To me, oh, it, actually, you know, you see, you see the vocation as it articulates itself in print, but then you meet the women who are living it. What was that like uh, yes, to it, actually see people who were trying to live this out in the circumstances of their ministries and in the circumstances of community life? Yeah. So I ended up, I worked in the inner city. If anybody knows Philadelphia, Kensington, um, is a it's a it's a rough neighborhood um and when i was there i was a saint vincent de paul visitor i went out and visited people you know re recent immigrants the elderly and ha homebound um all sorts of people and i would just say to them tell me your story and how can we help you how can the parish that i was working with help you um and i worked side by side with sisters there and at a certain point i thought i i really look up to these women you know they're wow. really part of my French, like they're really kind of badasses. Like, you know, that nobody messes with a sister. Like, and I would walk from house to house. Player. We're back to the rugby player. It's true. it's true. But I, I realized I looked up to them and I thought, do I just, do I want to be like them or am I one of them? And I finally came to the point where I thought, I think I am one of them. I don't think I just look up to them. And so then, you know, I was working in the inner city and then I moved into a, a formation program, a more formal formation program, uh, moved in with the sisters in the neighborhood. Uh, they were doing literacy and uh, English as a second language, English for non-native speakers. Uh, and I was still working at the parish. And then eventually I kind of said, okay, let's take the next step. And at that point you move into what we call the novitiate, uh, which is a process of deep study. So you're getting to know the congregation and know who we are, what our mission is, what our history is, and really discerning, kind of saying, is this the life that I want to live? And you learn about our vows. So sisters of St. Joseph, all apostolic women religious take three vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience. And so you learn about those vows and you kind of, you're growing in your relationship with God and saying, you know, is this the life where I am most fully myself and where I can give most fully to the world? And so that's a two-year process. And I was with sisters from all over the country at that point. Uh, oh, so you had an intercongregational, all the Sisters of St. Joseph mm -hmm. na nationally have one novitiate. Is that the case? Yep. Yeah, so we're a federation. So I was in Chicago for a year. Uh, it was the coldest winter I had ever experienced. I felt my my na nasal passages freeze, um, but it was a great blessing. We had wonderful presenters. I taught Montessori school while I was doing that uh, one day a week. They sent me one a dear sister in Philadelphia. Um, we we are traditionally, as you would know, teachers. Um, it's not in our charism. Our charism doesn't say that education is what our mission is, but traditionally that's what we had done as a community. Um, and so one of the sisters in Philadelphia while I was there had me teach congregational history. So that's like French Revolution, 17th century France to fourth graders. Jerry, you can only oh, imagine. They must, been, they must have been fascinated. Well, you know what? They taught me more about our charism. I, I once, you know, asked that our sisters were sent from France to the United States. And I said, you know, what do you think that felt like for that sister who had to do that? She sent two of her nieces and she, she was never going to see them again. And this fourth grade boy said to me, you know, he said, I think I know how she felt. I said, oh, well, why do you think she did it? And he said, because, you know, my dad, my dad coaches my little league baseball team. He said, and he knows he can put me in at any position and he knows that I'll be able to play it. And he said, she knew that her nieces could play any position. And so she must have just trusted them. And I thought, well, that's the best explanation I've ever gotten of that. So it was a blessing. And so in that time, I grew to know our congregation and, and really kind of say, oh, yeah, I want to say yes to this. Um, and make my first parenthetically we'll get I don't know whether we'll have time but we'll get back to this the sisters were founded before the French Revolution and once the French Revolution came this very flourishing foundation of women uh, uh, really was uh, was decimated and there were sisters of Saint Joseph who were taken to the guillotine and it took you know mother mother Saint John Fontbonne to reassemble the sisters after the French Revolution uh, and and bring them back to life. So cycles of birth, cycles of, of, of flourishing and cycles of death and cycles of rebirth uh, are not new 
uh, to your community, right? It's very true. Yeah, we, we say we're always, well, one of our things in our constitutions, you say, we say each day we make a new beginning in our little institute. And so every day we start over again, but there are these cycles in religious life. You know, people today say religious life is dying. You know, like there are fewer sisters, sisters are dying off. You say, oh, this is not new. This is, you know, it's cyclical. It, it was an anomaly that we had all these sisters in the 60s who entered. We had a, in 1961, I believe, we had 111, somebody's going to, can correct me, 111 sisters enter that year on one day. Wow, wow. In 2011, when I entered, we had one sister, me, enter for the whole year and for many years on either side. But it's a cycle, you know, and we refound ourselves and we realize how does our mission apply today in this space right. to the needs of the world? Because the needs are always changing. Colleen, did you, while you were in the novitiate, did you begin to sense that your your gifts uh, and your previous experience, that they were going to lead you in some direction? Or what happened from novitiate? Did, how, what was your next, uh, your next assignment after the novitiate? So, did you go yeah. right to studies? Did you want to go to studies right away? One of the things I, in my discernment early on, when I met with that vocation director, I had said, you know, I'm interested in studying. Um, and I said, you know, is it more valuable that I come with a degree to the congregation or that I bring our charism to my studies, let it influence, you know, my formation as a sister influence my studies. And in my discernment, she didn't tell me, she didn't say, oh, you should just come now. She let me figure it out and let me pray about it. Um, and so I came to the realization I needed to do this. I needed to take the step or I would never take it. Um, and so I didn't go right into studies. I went right into ministry after my novitiate. Well, what did you do right out of the novitiate? I was a college campus minister at Chestnut Oh Hill my Church. goodness. So this must have brought all kinds of memories uh, of, uh, of campus ministry back here at Fairfield, service trips, retreats, you know, oh, rugby, sure. you know, the whole routine. Yeah, for what sure. What for you? What did you well, bring from your Fairfield experience uh, to your work? I'm, I'm imagining you were at Chestnut Hill. Yeah, yeah. So I was uh, at Chestnut Hill. Well, uh, somebody I see in the chat asked if I went on any service trips. So at Fairfield, you know, the campus ministry department is excellent. I mean, there are multiple campus ministers serving different areas of expertise. When I got to Chestnut Hill, there were two of us, two sisters in campus ministry. And it, campus ministry was one room, whereas at Fairfield, you know, it's a chapel on top of a campus ministry center. Um, and so while I was there, uh, I learned at Fairfield, I learned how to do all these different things. I was leading retreats. I was going on service trips. I was, I went after um, the hurricane in New Orleans. I was in Mississippi. I was in the Philippines doing service. I was in Bridgeport doing service, kind of all over the place. So when I got to Chestnut Hill in Philadelphia, I had these skills that had been cultivated in the novitiate, but really seeds that had been planted at Fairfield. And so we hit the ground running because there, when there's only two people, you do everything. You, you know, <laughs> it's not like, oh, well, you take this, you know, you do this retreat and I'll do this service trip. It's like, no, we'll both be running the retreats. We'll I bet both you had no Deb, Deb Piccarazzi either to, you no, know, to cover no, no, everything. No. And my desk, I mean, it was really a gift. My, my desk was in the middle of that room that was the campus ministry center. And so every day, you know, you ask like, how did you learn to talk about your vocation or talk about the sisters? Every day to a T, kids would come in and say to me, I, kids I had never seen before. So why, why are you doing this? And so wow. it was wow. like, oh, well, I, I guess I got to come up with an explanation. But it was amazing. At Ch Chestnut Hill is a small liberal arts <clears throat> school. It, it would remind me of kind of uh, the Bellarmine College project at Fairfield. Mm -hmm. um, it serves, it was once uh, an all girls school uh, and, and really served that purpose for a long time. And then the needs changed. And so uh, now it's co-ed, but the kids who I had worked with in the parish in the inner city were the exact same kids who were on my couch. Really like Priscilla Lugo was the same kid on my couch four years later, our paths crossed again. And so wow. it was a great blessing to be able to work with them and to learn together. I learned what it meant to be a sister of St. Joseph doing that work. Wow, wow, wow. Did you imagine that you would stay working in that in that area? Or how do things work? What? How do the sisters, how do you and the sisters decide what comes next? 
Yeah. So it's, it's usually a mutual discernment. So, but in our, we call it like temporary profession. So at that point, every year you say, I want to do this again. And I have married friends who say to me, you know, maybe marriage should work that way. You get married <laughs> and then after the first year you renew again. And uh, so temporary. You, you just sign up again for yeah, another sign year. Up again. Like, did this work? Like, does this make sense? Because we're constantly assessing and, and in our prayer life saying to God, you know, God, is this where I'm meant to be? Am I finding life here? Right. How do you, how are you calling me? And so um, typically during that time, which can be three to six years, usually our congregation likes people to have two ministry experiences. So I knew going into Chestnut Hill that I would only be there for a certain amount of time. Um, but I mean, those kids, the, the students, those young people still, you know, I get texts, you know, bi-weekly from some of them. Some of them, we have set phone conversations. So those relationships were integral to who they became and who I've become. And so after I was at Chestnut Hill, um, the congregation, so we're based out of Philadelphia, but our congregation spans from Northern New Jersey down to, you know, Georgia, Florida. And so the city of Camden, Camden, New Jersey, our sisters have been there for, oh, 130 years. And so they wanted to, our congregation wanted to found a ministry there. Our sisters had always been in the schools teaching. They had run the Catholic schools in the city of Camden, deeply right, impoverished right, right. city. Um, at one point was per capita, the murder capital of the United States. And they said, you know, we want to, we want to start a ministry here. And so uh, I was invited to consider going to help found uh, what's called the S Sisters of St. Joseph Neighborhood Center, the SSJNC. Um, and so myself and another sister, like our first sisters, our first sisters, when they were called together by this Jesuit, he sent them out. He said, you know, divide the city and then circle it with love. Everybody take, there were six divide of them. Divide the city everybody, and circle it with love? Exactly. There were wow. six of them. And he said, everybody gets a spot. Everybody take a part, go out during the day, do the work, and then come back and we'll talk about it and process it. And so myself and uh, sister Bonnie, you know, we... We went, we went to Camden and she had been in the diocese of Camden for many years. And I had been in the inner city in Philadelphia. And they said, you know, uh, go out and figure out what the needs are. And so we walked the streets of Camden. We had to find a place to start this neighborhood center. And then we had to ask people, say to people, if you could do anything for your neighborhood, what would you do? And, you know, the initial reaction from folks, a lot of um, immigrants from Latin and South Central America, they looked at us like we were crazy. We said, no, no, really, if you if you could do anything, what would you do? And they started naming needs. You know, we, we really like to learn English. We'd like, you know, job counseling. We need help with food. There's so, so much food insecurity in the area. Uh, we'd love to have a community garden. We said, oh, that's great. And then we said, you know, before we leave you, do you want to sign up to help us do that? Because we're not oh, here to Lord do it on our own. And <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, and that, because that model doesn't work. That model of going into a community and saying, you know, let us do all these great things for you doesn't work. L what works is let's partner together because this is your community. I recognize that I'm an outsider to this community. So how can we share in life together? But how can we provide for your community so that ultimately this ministry is not our ministry or a ministry of the Sisters of St. Joseph. It's a ministry of the neighborhood. It, and that's what we say in our mission statement. We said, you know, we're about connecting neighbors to neighbors and neighborhoods to neighborhoods. So then connecting other communities. I mean, we've had all sorts of communities come in and we say it's about building relationships and how that can change the world if we get to know one another. I want to stop just for a second. Questions, comments before we go any further? Let's see. Okay. Oh, wait, there's a question here in the chat. Tom, Tom Ferranda. Sorry, I didn't answer it earlier. He wants to know what position I played in rugby. Uh, Tom, <laughs> well, let's get to the really important, this is important. These are important things you won't hear anywhere else. Um, I started out in the second row because I had no clue what I was doing. And so I was a bruiser in the second row. And then eventually I moved to eight man, uh, which I loved. That was a much better. There were no more black eyes. My mother was very appreciative of that. Got all, you kept all your teeth. Oh, oh, I was the, my, one of my noted history things that I was the first 
woman's player to wear a scrum cap. After I got a concussion, I said I can only keep playing if I wear some sort of protect protection. Colleen, um, I, I actually had a Fairfield rugby woman intern three years ago who played second row and number eight. Her name is Eleanor Sikowski. I had dinner with her a couple of weeks ago. Very nice girl. So we know second rows turn out tough and dedicated. So I, 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 that's, that's wonderful. Oh, I love it, Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. It, it must have been very tough then for you, Colleen, uh, to decide that you would go to studies. Uh, I know that uh, we've talked about you're going to BC and you're studying uh, what you call practical theology. And I know from following your writings uh, that you've been very involved uh, in the process of the synod, mm -hmm. uh, a term that is bandied about a fair amount, but I'm not sure, depending upon where people are in their parishes or their diocese, whether uh, folks have had much of an opportunity to see both the promise uh, and the challenge of uh, the synod and synodality. But since you're really there at BC, at the heart, I think, of the American response mm -hmm. and that you've been so involved, I wonder whether this is a slight deviation, but really not taking you away from your story, because your story is so much the story uh, of youth and women uh, assuming a voice and assuming uh, leadership and calling the church to grow uh, in the directions that it should be. Could you say something about uh, what, your, what your experience at Boston College is like and what your work uh, and your observations with uh, the American contribution to the Synod? So I'm just laying that yeah. question out and please take it uh, you know, in the direction that you think would be appropriate. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, a question that I often get is, you know, what gives you hope or, you know, why, why would you want to be a woman in the church? Like as a vowed woman religious, like I am a, a woman who has vowed my life to, to God, but lived in a particular way in the church. And I think, you know, the synodal process, thinking of the church as a body, you know, a body of people who are on a journey who need to be listening to one another and listening to the Holy Spirit. Like that's what gives me hope. Um, and so as I think about like where I am now and leaving, I, I left a very synodal place, you know, that neighborhood center was doing the work of listening to people and having conversations, having difficult conversations, but saying, you know, what do we need in the church? And I think I would encourage anyone to look at the, the synod right now, the Pope has, has really extended it out. And he said, you know, we need to open wide or enlarge our tent, uh, this line from scripture. We need to make more room so that everybody has a space in the church. Um, and so that means listening. And I've been amazed. I went into the synodal process here in Boston. Uh, I have to say, I was a little cynical. I went into it and I thought, oh, uh, we're just going to hear the same old stuff. And it's going to be, you know, uh, there's no hope that, you know, women's voices are going to get through or the LGBTQ voices are going to get through or people who have essentially left the church that their voices are going to get through. And so I was really heartened uh, by the experience of being in conversation with people who are studying theology, but then everyday people to hear their takes on, you know, I really think that you know, there's this conversation about women deacons, the ordination of women to the diaconate right now, the permanent diaconate, and saying like, hearing that, but then not just hearing it in these sessions and saying like, oh, that's an American thing, you know, uh, Americans are concerned with X, Y, and Z, but to say, or, you know, um, LGBTQ inclusion in the church, Americans are concerned with that. But if you go to Africa or Southeast Asia, those aren't concerns there. This document came out, um, at the end of last year, that's called the Continental Document. And it combines voices from all over the world. And what we found is that there are echoes of the same concerns in all different places. They take on the flavor of the local area, but in Bangladesh, they're saying, we wanna hear women preach. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, they're saying, you know, women are the people who are running our churches. They're the people who pass on the faith. 
You know, it's your mother and your grandmother who you get the faith from. And men need to be more responsible in helping cultivate that in the family. But we also need women in leadership positions. And so I think like that that has really given me a lot of hope about the Senate because I think people are listening, are listening. When you to say the Senate, people. just to be clear, Colleen, yeah. would you what what where is all this leading? What is the Senate? Yeah. So so it's a process. It's a synodal process. So on the local level, there have been listening sessions. So they basically say to people, everyday people, you know, uh, or at least your you diocese is supposed to be doing your diocese that. is supposed to be or other organizations. Right. You can look up the future church, um, voice of the faithful, discerning deacons. There are a whole number of virtual organizations that have been holding listening sessions. And so there are conversations happening about, you know, what has pained you in the church? What gives you joy? Um, you know, what is your vision? What do you think? What do you think the spirit is calling forth? Not just what's your vision, but what is the Holy Spirit inviting us to in this moment for the church to be alive um, and to be really living out the gospel, the good news, the gospel call. And so that's happened on the local level. And now it's kind of going up a level um, to now the continents, all the continents in the world are kind of synthesizing their information and listening. And so eventually what will happen this October, uh, a group will gather in Rome, bishops, lay people, representatives, and they'll bring all of that information together to have a larger conversation. And the Pope has said, it's not gonna end right there. It's gonna continue. Mm -hmm. He's added another year onto it, but it's really about how are we journeying together? How are we listening? And how are we implementing this? Not just, you know, oftentimes, People can say a lot, we can have big dreams, but like, where does the rubber hit the road? How do we actually implement this on the ground? Um, and that's not an easy thing. And it's not a it's not a quick process. The church moves very slowly, uh, but I think there's hope. There's hope because people are hearing reflected back to them or echoed back to them, their own, you know, opinions about the church, but they're hearing it from other people. And so oh, and you sound very, I mean, you're a smart woman. You've been around the block, but you sound hopeful. You know, uh, this is. I know. The first I'm time, amazed myself. <laughs> right? You sound remarkably hopeful. I have to say. It. I mean, it really is hopeful. I mean, there's a lot of things in the church. There's a lot of things in the world um, that are not necessarily hopeful. Uh, but this is a thing. I think when I look at it, I think, oh, this is when you look at the early church. This is what they were doing. This is when, you know, the Acts of the Apostles, if you read that, you know, they were all together. They shared all things in common. They were voicing their opinions and trying to figure out what does it mean to be a church? And so that's what's happening. I see it in some ways now. Now, it's not perfect. This is not a perfect process. But the fact that even, you know, that those voices come through, if you go to paragraph 65, it's the section on women in the Continental document. It is amazing. It made me it gave me goosebumps when I read it because I thought, oh, I thought I, I thought me and my sisters were the only people who thought this, but no, people around the world are thinking this. Content, Colleen, just for the sake of folks who are listening, if you go on to the USCCB, US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and look up Synod, you can get the, the concluding document. Colleen, is that the one you're thinking of? Or is yeah, that a different? yeah, yeah, yeah. You can okay. find that, and I think if you... <laughs> Not to plug my own work, but if you go to if you search my name and synod, you'll find an article that I wrote. There for you the, go. For there the National you go. Catholic Reporter, which has embedded embedded links that you can click on for all of these different things. So we're almost done. I I want to make sure that we save some time for more questions, discussion. Please, this is your opportunity. Ask a sister anything you want. I'll answer. Ask sister anything. All the things you were always wanting to ask, Sister. I don't want to banalize it, but uh, you know, Colleen is 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 an exceptional example of an intelligent, faith-filled woman who says, in the face of so many contradictions, uh, I still stand here, and I believe that God is calling me uh, to this vocation and to this form of witness. Uh, Colleen, I think, Colleen, do you have a question? Yeah, Jocelyn, do you want to voice that question? Jocelyn, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jocelyn. You... Sure. I wasn't sure if I should raise my hand. Um, thank you so much. I am just curious if you want to share 
what you're holding on to from Fairfield and what you've learned. And I know there's a million things and that's a hard question, but as someone who went to Fairfield and worked there for five years, I certainly, it's always going to be a part of me. And I'm just curious what you'd like to share with us. Oh, that's a great question, Jocelyn. Thank you, Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what's the most important thing I learned at Fairfield? What's the thing that has stuck with me? Um, I think a piece of what I learned at Fairfield is, you know, I learned a big piece of who I am uh, at Fairfield, which I mean is not, <laughs> you can't promise that to people. But I, I think I learned at Fairfield that if you show up, like if you show up to do the work, um, then then there there will be movement within you and you will discover things that you you never thought you would discover. And, the, and that that is not just about you. It's about going out into the world. Like I think to be, people for others, men and women for others. Like that was instilled in me at Fairfield. Um, and I was, I was taught to ask questions like that, as Jerry said, like, I'm hopeful. It is not cheap hope. It is not cheap grace. Like it is, I, I was taught by all of those professors I mentioned to ask critical questions uh, and to hold my own feet to the fire, but to hold the feet of, you know, institutions to the fire and say, you know, things aren't right. There are, there are things that aren't right in the world. So how do we work for justice? How do we work for hope? Yeah. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Ooh. Looks like we've got, Carolyn is asking, can you choose one thing that you do that brings you the deepest joy? Probably also another tough question to narrow down. <laughs> um, oh, one thing that brings me the deepest joy, as right now as a student, um, it's really a privileged position to be in, to be able to study. And but uh, one of my greatest joys is that I get to be, I get to be in in the classroom with other people and share in a, in community life in a different way. Um, I'm living with sisters, but I'm I'm studying side by side with Jesuits who are in formation, with lay people who who are saying I want to do this with my life. And I think being able to witness to them becoming better ministers and how they make me a better minister in the process. Like that brings me great joy. There's a, I, there's a, a alum from alumni from Fairfield who's in one of my classes. And the first day we met each other, she had a Fairfield sweatshirt on. She said, I said, Oh, you went to Fairfield. She said, yeah, I did. She said, Oh, did you? I said, yeah. She said, Oh, well, maybe we know the same people. I said, Oh, well, when did you graduate? She said, Oh, I graduated in 2019. I said, Oh, oh, I graduated in 2009, 10 years before you. I, we might know some of the same people, but I think it's being with younger people, older people, all sorts of people um, and sharing in the joys of everyday life. Like I uh, I made my final vows in 2019 in September. And so I, I let that slip at some point in one of my classes. I said, you know, today, September 15th is my vow anniversary. It's my anniversary of vows. Well, the people in my class were like, we have to go out and celebrate your anniversary. <laughs> we went out for ice cream. But I think just to be able to be able to witness to this life brings me joy. But to be able to share this life, to say, like, it's not my it's not my own. You know, it, it, that was not about saying this is what a sister is. It was about being together and sharing ice cream and and laughing and just having fun and not having to talk about theology or the synodal process or any of that. But to say, oh, you know. What's giving you hope right now? What's bringing right. you joy? So that's that's what brings me joy these days. I, I notice. Thank you, Colleen. I mm -hmm. notice uh, as I as I have flipped through the participants that we have a number of sisters of Saint Joseph, and we have a number of people who have been involved in the Murphy Center for Ignatian Spirituality here at Fairfield. Um, idiosyncratically, I acknowledged in my own life. My, my debt of gratitude to the Sisters of St. Joseph, I would be really um, unjust if I didn't acknowledge that our own uh, experience now and the power of Ignatian spirituality uh, at Fairfield uh, was strengthened and undergirded by the work of Sister Karen Doyle. Uh, Sister Karen Doyle worked with Father Jim Bowler in the very beginnings of establishing the formation program for spiritual directors. So Karen Doyle trekked up here every month from Chestnut Hill, 
giving classes to our interns and then offering programs on Sundays to teach people how to uh, become supervisors, to teach people how to become, uh, to give the, the, the 19th annotation. And uh, I told Karen Doyle um, the truth that I worked with Karen every in every element of this and there. And I did it really not because I was being valiant, but because I learned from her every time I was with her. Uh, and so, uh, Karen, I don't know whether you're listening, but those of you who do know Karen, uh, please tell her uh, that her that her contribution, uh, her enduring gift uh, to Fairfield University is celebrated this evening when we celebrate uh, her young sister, Colleen Gibson. Um, so thank you, Colleen. Thank you, everyone uh, who's taken the time to participate in this exchange, which I think thanks to you, Colleen, and the witness of your own life, your integrity and your courage and your candor has given us all hope uh, and an and inspiration for us um, to live our lives with one desire only, to be always what God wants us to be. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank you so much, Jerry. I mean, it's really, it's been a blessing to be here. And I always give credit to my experience at Fairfield. Uh, it taught me how to pray. It grew, helped me grow my relationship with God. I would not be the person I am today without my my life at Fairfield. Uh, and so I give thanks for it every day for the, the Jesuits who I met, the Ignatian spirituality I was introduced to, the opportunity to do you know, the 19th annotation of the exercises while I was at Fairfield. Um, all of those things have contributed to who I am. And I carry, you know, the same way that I carry the people from Camden with me everywhere that I go, I carry the relationships that I made at Fairfield with me. And whether uh, whether I recall people by name in my mind or I just recall them in heart, uh, it's often been graces when I'm on retreat that people from those four years pop up in my heart. And so uh, they're remembered lovingly and they're still forming me. You know, I think of Patricia Brennan, who is at the, who did a lot of spirituality of happy memory. Um, you know, often, I often say, you know, what would Patricia do? What would, you know, X, Y, what would this professor tell me to do in this moment? So thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it's been a gift to be able to share and I'm looking forward. I see that the chat keeps going. I'm looking forward to, to looking through the chat. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Colleen. And uh, I see a lot of links being shared in there. And I was actually going to ask Colleen's permission to share some of that. We will be sending a follow up email uh, with a link to the recording. So if you know anybody who was unable to tune in tonight and would like to do so, we'll be sending that in the next few days. And I'll make sure we include links to Colleen's article that she referenced, uh, information about her podcast and all of that. Stay tuned. Our next event in this series is on Monday, April 24th. So more more information will be going out about that soon. And thank you all again and have a wonderful rest of the night.